class, this is Ms. Sheely. I am here to present the next set of notes in our Chapter 6, Human uh, Anatomy and Physiology, and this is our blood systems. This is 6.2, the blood system. All right, so the first thing we want to talk about is a gentleman named Dr. William Harvey. He's been actually credited with the discovery of the circulation of the blood in the body. He actually combined his research with earlier discoveries, and then he published these results. Once he published his results, it still did not persuade people to go against the previous theories of how the blood moved through the body. So he actually started touring Europe to demonstrate the experiments that he did and some others that helped to reinforce his ideas and to falsify those previous theories. So I have a little video on his work. But how do we know so much about the body? Well, people have been studying and learning about it for centuries. Over 300 years ago, a man in England made some important discoveries. His name was Dr. William Harvey, and he proved that blood flowed out of the heart through the arteries and back through the veins, always in one direction. Here he is long ago in his laboratory. Yes, there. That should make your veins stand out nicely. You know, of course, that this doesn't hurt a bit. My experiment was very simple, really, and anyone could do it. Yeah. You flatten a vein by pushing out the blood. By the way, the blood isn't really blue, you know. It only looks that way underneath the skin. Huh. Hmm? Ah. Now, if you lift the finger closer to the heart, nothing happens. The vein stays flat because no blood flows back into it. But if you lift the other finger, well, you can see how the blood rushes in. So we know for sure that the blood flows only in one direction. It comes out from the heart through arteries we can't see and goes back to the heart in this direction through the veins. Round and round it goes over and over again. Thank you, Samuel. And so the blood circulates, propelled through the body by this marvelous pump, an organ I have studied for many, many years. You know, it's one of the first things formed in any new living creature. In this egg, for example, a tiny chicken is only a few days old. Its heart is already beating, and some veins and arteries have formed too. There it is, the beginning of life. Oh, my. There are still many secrets here for me. All right, so that puts a, an interesting little spin on things. A um, little humor there, but that gives you an idea of William Harvey and what he was looking into and with his discovery, circulation of the blood. Arteries. So here's a picture of an artery. All arteries carry blood away from the heart. Except for the pulmonary artery, they all transport oxygenated blood to each organ of the body. The pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lungs, so that's our exception there. Artery walls are really thick and elastic, and that's so that they can stretch under the high pressure of the blood. And you have three main layers. You have a thick or tough outer wall. This is the tunica externa. Then you have a thick inner layer of muscle and elastic fibers, and this is called the tunica media. And then you have a thin layer of endothelial cells, and this is the tunica intima. And this endothelial cells surround a very narrow central tube, and that tube, that opening is called the lumen of the artery. So as arteries stretch, they actually pulse, and that's because of this high pressure that they're under. We'll talk about that in a little bit more in the next uh, few slides. The next slide. So arterial blood pressure. So the high pressure of the artery is your systolic pressure, and that leads to or is due to the blood leaving the heart. The low pressure of the artery, that's called your diastolic pressure. 
You have arterioles. Arterioles are smaller arteries um, that branch off of the larger arteries. And arterioles have a higher density of muscle cells. And that's because these, these muscle cells respond to our hormones and our neural signals. And they respond to these hormones and neural signals in order to either vasoconstrict, which means to contract. And by contracting, they uh, make the vessel, the artery, have a smaller lumen or opening. And this will increase your blood pressure. Or those hormones and neural signals will cause the um, arterioles to vasodilate, which means to relax. Relaxing will increase the size of the lumen in the arteriole, and that will then decrease the blood pressure. So capillaries. Here is our artery and then our vein, and they're connected to each other via capillaries. So capillaries are the tiny blood vessels that carry blood supply to and from the body cells. So the body cells are here in this middle area. Capillaries are the only blood vessels where substances can actually be exchanged between the blood and the body cells. And then you have veins. Veins carry blood to the heart, except for the pulmonary vein, they carry deoxygenated blood. Pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart, but they are carrying blood to the heart. It's just oxygenated. Veins are wider than arteries. They have a much larger lumen, but they have very thin walls, and they are usually carrying blood under very low pressure. If you're looking here at our cross section of a vein, you have a thin outer wall, still called the tunica externa. You have a thin layer of muscle and elastic fibers also still called the tunica media, and you still have the one single layer of endothelial cells called the tunica intima, um, but this is now surrounding a much wider central tube or lumen. Then here, we can see how veins have valves. Arteries don't have valves, um, but veins do. Valves prevent the backflow of blood, so they're gonna prevent the blood from going um, back through. So the blood will go this way, and if it tries to go back, those valves will, will close. It's kind of like those, those spikes that you can drive over with your car. You can drive over in one direction, but you can't reverse over them. All right, so we need to be able to identify the different blood vessels, and I have a picture here of your artery, your vein, and your capillary, and how they kind of work. So you need to be able to think about the size, the diameter. So uh, artery is going to be a much larger than 10 micrometers. A capillary is going to be around 10 micrometers. And then a vein is actually going to be variable size, but it's typically larger. So both arteries and veins are typically larger than capillary. You need to think about the relative thickness of the wall and the diameter of the lumen. Remember, the lumen is the opening. So arteries have very thick walls and narrow lumen. Veins have thin walls but wide lumen, so they're kind of opposite. And capillaries have an extremely thin wall, and then we don't usually consider the lumen of the capillary. The artery and the vein both have three layers, the tunica externa, tunica media, and tunica intima. The capillary is only one layer, and it is endothelial cells um, in a very thin or single layer. In the muscles and the elastic fibers, these are abundant in the artery only. They are not found at all in the capillary, and they are only found in very small amounts in the veins. And valves, we do not have any valves in arteries or capillaries, but as we just saw in the previous slide, they are present in many of our veins to prevent that backflow. All right, so here's a heart. The blood is pumped around the body by the heart. It takes actually only about 30 seconds for the blood to go around the body once. And it starts the left side of the heart, uh, or starting with the left side of the heart. What route does the blood follow to complete one circuit of the body? All right, so it leaves, so we're leaving the heart if we're on the left side, we're leaving the heart and we're going to the body cells. So the left side of the heart pumps oxygen-rich blood to the rest of the body. The, uh, this blood is supplies the body cells with oxygen, and then if it gives off oxygen, what gas does it then pick up from the body cells, and where does it go next? 
Well, the blood picks up carbon dioxide from the body cells. This is oxygen poor blood and it travels right back into the heart, but on the other side. So it goes into the right side of the heart. This oxygen poor blood needs to be, needs to lose its carbon dioxide and it needs to pick up oxygen to transport back to those parts of the body. So it's going to leave the lung, it's going to leave the heart to go to the lungs. So next, the right side of the heart pumps the blood the poor oxygen poor blood into the lungs. In the lungs, the blood gets rid of the waste, carbon dioxide, and collects more oxygen. So you have an exchange of carbon dioxide for oxygen here in the lungs. Then we're going to leave the lungs and go back into the left side of the heart, into the atrium. So this is oxygen rich blood and it returns to the left side of the heart. And this completes the blood's journey through the body because after that it will then go into the atrium and then out through the ventricle and then back to the body cells. During one complete circuit of the body, the blood actually passes through the heart twice. It goes in one side and out and then in and out and that is just one circulation. The heart has two jobs to do, so the circulatory system involves what we call a double circulation because it has two jobs. All right, so your heart structure, we've kind of looked at this already when we practice drawing. Um, you have a right atrium and a left atrium. You have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. Notice the thickness of the walls here in the atrium, very, very thin compared to the thickness down here of the ventricles. You have valves, you have tricuspid valves. This valve over here is called a mitral valve. It can also be called the um, bicuspid valve. Um, they're also called atrioventricular valves. So very, um, very many names for those valves. And these are the valves between the atrium and the ventricles here. Uh, so you go into the right atrium, you go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. You leave the right ventricle through this little valve right here. This is called the pulmonary valve because it's going to the lungs. And then you go from the pulmonary valve, go from the pulmonary valve to the pulmonary artery, which goes to the lungs. We go to the lungs, we get oxygenated, we come back into the left atrium via the pulmonary veins. Then we go from the left atrium to the left ventricle through the mitral valve or the bicuspid. Um, then we leave the left ventricle through the aortic valve. The aortic valve then takes us to the aorta, which will then take us to the body. And then we can come back from the body via the vena cava, either the superior or inferior vena cava. All right, so arthrosclerosis. This is a degenerative disease. All right, so arthrosclerosis, this is a degenerative disease. This is an area of the arteries um, where the artery walls become damaged. And that's because we have fibrous tissue growing in our artery walls. We have a buildup of cholesterol in the damaged area. So we have some damage, then we have a buildup of cholesterol. That this cholesterol buildup will eventually form plaque, and then the artery wall will lose its elasticity. If it doesn't have the elasticity, then it it cannot um, pump the blood and get that increase in our systolic pressure. So as the buildups of cholesterol and plaque form, the lumen is going to narrow. This is going to restrict blood flow. If the plaque ruptures, then the blood clotting will be triggered, and blood clots are known as coronary thrombosis. Um, we'll actually get to that in just a little bit. All right, so how do we control this heartbeat? So the beating of the heart is due to something called a myogenic muscle contraction. So this means that the myocytes, the muscle cells, are the origin of the contraction, and it's not controlled externally by anything. So there's a region of myocytes, so muscle cells, that are called the senoatrial node, also known as the pacemaker or the SA node. And they actually control the rate of the heartbeat. So the senoatrial node is located um, near the top of the right ventricle. And what happens is we have a wave of excitations that's sent from that SA node. You can see here they're sent out, causing the atrium, both atrium, both right and left atrium, to contract. 
This excitation is then conducted to an AV node that's located lower on the left H, right atrium, excuse me. And that AV node then passes through nerves of the muscles because the muscles, uh, the left, the ventricles have much thicker muscles and um, it causes them to contract, causes those muscles and those thick muscles and the ventricles to contract. So the myogenic initiation of the contraction means that the heart does not stop beating. It is not a conscious process. Once it starts beating, once it's going, we don't have to think about it. Think about this fact. The cardiac muscle is indefatigable. What does this mean? How would you expect the histology of it to differ from regular muscle tissue? What happens if you are running a long race or a marathon? How do your leg muscles feel? The heart does not get that fatigued. And then here we have a cardiac cell contracting. You can see that um, surface area. All right, so let's talk about that cardiac cycle and how that SA node works a little bit more. So that SA, that senoatrial node, gets the signals from two nerves. Both of these nerves originate from the cardiovascular center of the medulla oblongata, and they can cause an increase or a decrease in the heartbeat or contraction. So the cardiovascular center monitors three things. It monitors pH blood pressure or BP, and O2 concentration or oxygen concentration. If your body has low blood pressure, low oxygen concentration, and low pH, then your cardiovascular center senses that the heart needs to speed up, and then therefore it will increase the blood flow and increase the blood pressure. If the blood flow is increasing, then we'll get more oxygen, and if the oxygen is um, if we're getting more oxygen, then we will be able to increase the pH um, and decrease that pH. So if you have a high blood pressure, high oxygen concentration, and high pH, then that means the heart needs to slow down so that we can decrease that pH, that, excuse me, so that we can decrease that blood pressure and decrease the amount of O2 in the body, which will then affect the pH. We can also control the heart rate by using epinephrine. Epinephrine is also called adrenaline, and it can also control the SA node. It is produced in the adrenal glands, which is why it's called adrenaline, and the brain controls the secretion of adrenaline. The brain releases adrenaline when physical activity is needed due to a threat or an opportunity. So adrenaline or epinephrine is typically called a fight or flight. And that's all we've got for today. So definitely look over these notes um, and review this. It's a lot of complicated information, but I know you can do it. Have a great day.